Welcome to my continuation on the lesson about harmonic oscillators. In this video, we're going to finish solving the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the harmonic oscillator. Let me begin by first recapping where we left off in the previous lesson. So briefly, we set up the time-independent Schrodinger equation with a potential corresponding to the harmonic oscillator. Next, we introduced a dimensionless x and a constant c based on our total energy level. Using these quantities, we formulated a partially non-dimensionalized version of the harmonic oscillator Schrodinger equation, which was given by the following. Lastly, we approximated this differential equation in the limits of the domain, where x tilde was much larger than z, and then we quote-unquote solved this differential equation and came up with a solution involving the exponential of negative x squared over 2 and the exponential of x squared over 2. Now, if we just look at the solution and analyze it, we see that when x tilde approaches negative infinity or infinity, the b term approaches 0, but the a term approaches infinity because of the positive power on the exponential. However, in quantum mechanics, the solution to the Schrodinger equation must be normalizable, and a function that approaches infinity at the edges of the domain is clearly not normalizable. Therefore, the integration constant a in the solution to our simplified differential equation must be zero in order to guarantee normalizability of our wave function. Now, the solution to the approximate differential equation we're left with just has the negative exponential, but how do we get from here to the solution of the full non-approximated differential equation? This is where we'll use another trick. We'll suppose that the solution to the full differential equation is given by some function small h of x tilde times what we found above, the exponential of negative x squared over 2. h can be any generic function, there's no restriction on h. So by extension, the psi of x tilde that h is a part of is also technically an arbitrary function, just with this additional exponential term which specifies it a bit better but you'll see that this exponential term is actually pretty useful because it'll help us convert our differential equation into an equation involving h, which will be much more manageable than the original psi equation. So let's go ahead and substitute psi of x tilde into our differential equation. We'll also need to express the left-hand side in terms of h. To do that, we'll take the expression for psi in terms of h and differentiate it once to get this psi prime using the product rule. And then we'll differentiate this psi prime once more with respect to x tilde to get the second derivative, again using both the product rule and the chain rule. Now let's take the second psi derivative and plug it into our partially dimensionless differential equation to get a new differential equation in terms of h. Let's now simplify this. We can cancel the exponential on both sides since the exponential is never zero to get the following. The x tilde squared terms cancel and after moving everything to the left, this is what we get for our differential equation in h. I'm going to call this equation 2 since I already named an equation 1 in the previous video. Now does this equation remind you of something? Well, let me go on the side to explain further and maybe jog your memory. Recall that this equation, given by d2y by dx squared minus 2x dy by dx plus 2 times lambda times y equals 0, where lambda is some real constant, this equation is called the Hermite differential equation. To solve this equation, you need to use the series solutions method, where y is given by a polynomial series as such. When you do that, you get two categories of solutions to the Hermite differential equation. The first category of solutions corresponds to the even indices of the series, where n is 0, 2, 4, etc. The second category of solutions corresponds to the odd indices, 1, 3, 5, and so on. Now, if lambda is a non-negative integer, then one of these series will terminate while the other will continue on forever. The solution that corresponds to the terminating series forms what are called the Hermite polynomials. The other solution that continues forever, well, we don't really care about that solution right now. So let's use these recalled facts and apply them to the simplified harmonic oscillator equation. You can see that our equation 2 looks just like the Hermite ODE, with c minus 1 representing 2 times lambda, which would mean that lambda would be given by c minus 1 over 2. So therefore, if we look at the solutions to the Hermite differential equation, the corresponding solutions for the even and odd series indices would look like this. Note that I've retained the lambda here in favor of c minus 1 over 2 just because it simplifies my notation. Now let's take these two solutions h odd and h even and let's plug them into psi of x tilde which if you recall is given by this equation. 
Plugging h odd and h even into psi will give us two separate solutions for the wave function psi, one corresponding to h even and the other corresponding to h odd. Now we can't pack our bags just yet and say that we found the solution to the harmonic oscillator Schrodinger equation, we still have to apply some physics to the solution and narrow it down a little more. And to apply this physics we'll consider two scenarios involving lambda. The first scenario is for a non-integer or a negative integer lambda. In that case, none of my series will terminate. This is actually bad because it means that the power on the x will also go on to infinity as the series progresses, since the series doesn't have a stopping point at the top of the sigma, at the top of my summation notation. When this happens, then at the edges of the domain, at x tilde approaching positive or negative infinity, the individual terms on the series will approach infinity and will actually overpower the damping effect of the negative exponential. I'm going to show you why this is the case, starting with the even series. Let's look at the ratio of the successive coefficients a sub 2k and a sub 2k plus 2. Now the coefficient a sub 2k is already written in my series up here, it's the coefficient of x to the power 2k. Meanwhile, a sub 2k plus 2 is given by taking this a sub 2k coefficient and replacing the k by k plus 1. If we do that, this is what we get. We can cancel all the lambda factors except lambda minus 2k. We can cancel the negative 2 to the k and we can cancel the a naughts. After doing that and rearranging the expression to make it a simple numerator over denominator, this is what we get. Now, if we use the definition of the factorial, the 2k factorial and 2k plus 2 factorial cancel each other out, but we're only left with 2k plus 2 and 2k plus 1 in the denominator. The 2s also cancel out in the numerator and denominator, giving us this final value for the ratio of coefficients a sub 2k plus 2 to a sub 2k. We can also compute the ratio of successive odd coefficients, a sub 2k plus 3 and a sub 2k plus 1. The a sub 2k plus 1 is just the coefficient shown in the psi sub odd power series, the coefficient of x tilde to the 2k plus 1, while the a sub 2k plus 3 is found by replacing k by k plus 1. Simplifying this ratio gives us the following. If we now look at both of these ratios as k becomes a very large number, you'll find that you'll be able to ignore the negative lambda and the plus 1 slash plus 3s because the k is so large, and when you ignore them, the ratio of the successive even and odd coefficients will turn out to be approximately equal to 1 over k. Now this ratio is really important because it shows that when you get to really large values of k, the even and odd series both behave the same as the exponential of x tilde squared. Let me actually go on the side and prove this to you since you may not take my word at face value here. If I write the exponential of x squared in its series form, this is what we have. The sum from j equals 0 to infinity of x tilde to the power 2j over j factorial. If we now take the ratio of successive coefficients, the j plus 1 coefficient divided by the j coefficient, I actually end up with 1 over j plus 1, and for very large values of j, it's approximately equal to 1 over j. So the ratio of successive coefficients in the exponential of x tilde squared is 1 over j, but so is the ratio of successive coefficients in the even and odd series for psi, which I'll copy-paste here. As a result, it's pretty reasonable to conclude that at really large values of the index, when you start looking at terms with a large power on the x tilde, it's reasonable to conclude that these non-terminating series behave similarly to e to the x tilde squared. As a result, since we're only multiplying by e to the negative x tilde squared over 2 out front, the behavior of psi overall, both psi even and psi odd, will resemble that of e to the x tilde squared over 2 when the respective series does not terminate. And this is a problem because when x tilde gets to the edges of the domain, when x tilde approaches positive or negative infinity, then psi sub even and psi sub odd will also blow up, which will clearly violate the normalization condition. Psi will not be normalizable when the series does not terminate. This means that values of lambda corresponding to scenario 1 are not physically valid, so lambda cannot be a non-integer or a negative integer. And this takes us to scenario 2 where lambda is a non-negative integer. Let's copy-paste the two solutions for psi in this setting. Now, when lambda is a non-negative integer, one of these series will terminate and give you the Hermite polynomials as we mentioned earlier in the video, while the other series will continue forever. But we don't care about that other series, because if it continues forever, then it will eventually diverge for very large k at the edges of the domain. This is what we just showed, that solutions corresponding to these non-terminating series are not normalizable. 
This means that after eliminating the non-terminating series, the solution wave function to the harmonic oscillator time-independent Schrodinger equation is given by some constant capital K, which I'm using to represent the A0 or A1, times our exponential, times our Hermite polynomial capital H corresponding to the degree given by N, which I've now used to replace lambda. If N is an odd number, then the Hermite polynomial will only have odd powers based on the odd series. If N is an even number, the Hermite polynomial will only have even powers. I'm also going to index psi by n because I could have multiple admissible wave functions that would solve the harmonic oscillator Schrodinger equation for any value of n. n equals 0 is valid and so is n equals 1, 2, 3, etc. The overall wave function that will be the solution for a particular harmonic oscillator will be a linear combination of these individual psi sub n's. If we now apply the normalization condition to these individual psi sub n's, we can actually find the value of the constant capital K. I won't do that here because the normalization involves integrating the generic Hermite polynomials and using generator functions, which will require a third part to my harmonic oscillator lesson and won't add much to your learning. Nonetheless, after normalization, this is what you get for your psi sub n. Note that I've now converted the dimensionless x tilde to the regular x. But there's an additional missing piece in our discussion, the energy. We haven't spoken about that much, have we? Recall that the energy was part of the constant C that we created in our non-dimensionalization process, and that this C was absorbed into lambda as C minus 1 over 2. Let's now substitute C in terms of the original constants into the expression for lambda, and then let's isolate the energy E. Now, I showed you earlier that the only permissible series solutions to the harmonic oscillator Schrodinger equation are the series solutions that terminate. The non-terminating series diverge and disobey the normalization condition, therefore lambda can only be a non-negative integer, which I'll call n. So the energy cannot be continuous. The only energy values that are allowed are discrete values e sub n, which correspond to the integer n. Once again, we've shown that energy is quantized, it's discrete, just like it was quantized for the infinite square well. The individual states, the psi sub ends of the quantum particle in a harmonic oscillator, are restricted to certain energy levels corresponding to different values of n. Let's now complete the solution to our harmonic oscillator by putting everything into the full wave function capital psi, which depends on both position and time. Full psi will be composed of a linear combination of small psi of x, this giant expression here, multiplied by the time function given by this imaginary exponential. Of course, the energy E sub n is quantized as shown by this equation. And this is the overall wave function solution to the quantum harmonic oscillator. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.